Hey, it's Dr. Brian Mole, the diabetes coach, and welcome back to the Mastering Blood Sugar podcast. I have with me a new friend, someone that I am very excited to interview, and that is the carnivore MD, Dr. Paul Saladino. So, Dr. Saladino, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on. It's good to be here. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I have been just devouring <laughs> your content over the past couple of months and read your book to about two and a half times. I'm about halfway through it for the third time. And anybody who's read it can probably figure out why there's, there's a lot to absorb there. You know, the first time through, you know, blew my mind a little bit and kind of made me challenge some of the beliefs that I held that a lot of people, I think, in functional medicine community and natural health world hold. So I had to go through it another time. And then this time I'm really digging in deep and doing some research from a totally different perspective, seeing a lot of your, you know, podcasts and interviews and learned a lot from you. So excited to have you on and expose my audience to some new thoughts here, some new ways of thinking about some things that we thought were pretty well settled when it comes to health. You know, I was doing a podcast with my friend yesterday and we were just talking about, we have, we all have these very well-intentioned parents, but I think that many of our parents may have programmed us in a way to expect or to believe deeply that vegetables are invariably good for humans. And we can even get into definitions of what a vegetable is versus a fruit and why that matters. But I think it's kind of fun challenging those assumptions. And there's this great Mark Twain quote that I've been kind of ruminating on recently that it's much easier, I'll paraphrase it, it's much easier to fool a man than it is to convince him that he's been fooled. And not that our parents were really fooling us, but it's hard to deprogram people. I think as humans, we accept a series of constraints of our environment and what we know to be true in quotations about nutrition and human health. And when those are challenged, it can be a little, a little jarring sometimes. So it's fun to think like, well, what assumptions can we really substantiate and what should we reconsider? I think that's so important because otherwise we just get stale and we just assume things to be true and oftentimes they're not true. So we have to sort of go back and make sure that we are seeing things accurately. I think you do a really good job of doing that. And, you know, it's not just our parents. I mean, our doctors, you know, growing up, our colleagues, both been involved in functional medicine. And, you know, I went through that IFM certification, which is a great program. And it's a, you know, it's a, I love the group, but I think there's some, again, some assumptions there that maybe we need to sort of reinvestigate a little bit. So, yeah, you know, I'll just be honest. I did the IFM training too, and I got the IFM CP. Uh -huh. I, didn't, I didn't love it. You know, I found I found it to be a little bit too light on mechanisms and case studies for my liking, and a lot, a little bit too heavy on kind of certain paradigms that didn't really resonate with me. But that's what's fun is to, sure, to dig in and sure. say like, well, let's look at the mechanisms and biochemistry and really understand what's going on here. So yeah, yeah. And, and as people are going to learn very quickly here about you, you definitely go heavy on the science and the mechanisms, which I, you know, obviously is important, especially when you're challenging the status quo so much. I think it's important that you bring some evidence behind that. So you mentioned a second ago about vegetables. And so let's start there because I think I always said to my patients, my clients, my friends, well, you know, when it comes to nutrition, there's pretty much disagreement universally about everything except that vegetables are good for us. <laughs> and then I read your book. So explain a little bit about what vegetable, you know, what I guess what vegetables are, you know, why they can potentially not be, you know, so healthy as we thought they were. So yeah, I think the framework for this discussion is the following that okay. I think most people will, although this is not a truism either, I think many people will agree that seed oils and processed sugars do not benefit humans and are not evolutionarily consistent. Though there are people in the space who debate that both for mm -hmm. seed oils and processed sugars and for seed oils, they point to a set of literature that we can talk about if you want, though that's kind of down a rabbit hole. And for processed sugars, sort of many of these people in nutritional space will point to, oh, it's just calories. And if you limit your calories, then you will lose weight and be more metabolically healthy, which in some sense is true. But I think that there is a compelling amount of evidence to suggest that the processing of sugars, that is fructose, glucose, sucrose, and others, changes something about the food matrix. And they do appear to, to look to behave physiologically differently in humans, which is a fascinating rabbit hole. But if we accept those two things, we can move on to vegetables. But the reason I mentioned those first is because I think that if people are not, have not yet eliminated seed oils, that is things like corn, canola, safflower, sunflower, grapeseed, et cetera, from their diet, and, 
or you have not eliminated processed sugar, you don't even need to worry about whether you're eating vegetables or not. And it's very clear that eating plants of any sort is much better than eating a processed food, which are the foods that are very high in seed oils. But what I have found in my practice, both personally and clinically, and you may have experienced as well, is that for a lot of people, just cutting out processed food doesn't fully correct things. Sometimes autoimmune issues persist. Sometimes GI issues persist, whether it's IBS or IBD or gas and constipation or other issues, you know, autoimmune issues of a myriad set. And so then you have to look a little deeper. My story started with that, that sort of conundrum for myself. And I was in a space in my residency where I was eating an organic paleo diet and I was really strict about it. I have a foible, which is also a, I guess, a, an asset that I'm strict and I, some would say obsessive. So when I do something, I do it and I don't mess around with, you know, kind of uh, flippantly about my diet. So I was eating a very strict organic paleo diet of greens and vegetables and nuts and seeds and quote unquote medicinal mushrooms and meat, which is grass fed and avocado. And my eczema got to be the worst it had ever been. And so I was like, what am I doing? Like, I'm not eating any processed sugar. I'm not eating any soda. I don't, even think, I don't eat anything out of a can. I don't eat anything out of a box, but my eczema is going crazy. So there's clearly something still in my diet that is triggering my autoimmunity. And some might say, well, you can take a, a pill or you can use a cream to ameliorate those symptoms. But for me, that wasn't a satisfactory explanation because I knew that, you know, if the immune system was reacting in levels of my epidermis, it was probably reacting in other places. And I, I didn't like the idea of having an autoimmune condition. So that was the beginning of my thinking about vegetables a little differently and the, really the beginning of my thinking about a carnivore or carnivore-ish type diet and perhaps reimagining plant foods on a toxicity spectrum in a way that I hadn't seen conceptualized. A controversial part of that was saying, do why do I accept that vegetables are good for me? So before we dive into that, let's talk about what vegetables are versus fruit. So a lot of time in the literature, these things get grouped together, which makes this complicated because they will do epidemiology. They'll do observational studies, either prospective or retrospective cohort studies, and they'll ask people about their intake of fruit and vegetables. It's pretty rare that they do, oh, how much fruit do you eat or how many vegetables do you eat? They're just saying, how many fruit and vegetables do you eat? It's like a, it's like a colloquialism, right? We say you eat more fruit and vegetables. We know you're healthier, but these are very different parts of plants. And from a, from a philosophical perspective, a plant has the same goals as other forms of life on the planet from different kingdoms, be that dolphins or humans or insects or bacteria or viruses, which many people debate are alive in the first place. But plants want to pass their DNA to the next generation. In order to do that, they must not become eaten or killed by other animals or insects or fungi. And so Plants out of necessity, because they are stuck in the ground, have developed defense chemicals. This is not really conjecture. This is botanical science. And it's not really denied by anyone. It's just the, I think that the importance or the potential harm of those plant chemicals is where people disagree. Some people think that they're benign for humans or that we've adapted to them. I've taken the alternate perspective the more I've looked at the data. But from the perspective of a plant, you are rooted in the ground. You have leaves, you have a stem, you have roots, and you have seeds. And those parts of plants are traditionally what we think of as vegetables and seeds being a, an umbrella family that also includes things like nuts, grains, and beans, which are all seeds. Anyone will know if you plant a bean or you sprout a bean, it grows into a plant. So it's a seed. We just call it a bean. The same with a grain or a nut. You can sprout an almond and it will grow into an almond tree. And seeds are seeds. People you know, think of seeds. Oh, obviously, it's a seed. So they're all seeds, which means they're all plant reproductive efforts. They're all plant babies. So sometimes we think of those as vegetables, but definitely we think of things like stems and leaves as vegetables. Kale, spinach, chard, arugula, Brussels sprouts. And we often think of roots as vegetables, though we could get technical and call them tubers or we could call them other things, but we think of all these things as vegetables. Now, a fruit is a very different thing from the plant. The fruit is either a sweet or non-sweet effort that the plant uses to usually move its seeds around. So sometimes a plant will put its seed on a whirly bird and it flies out of the tree and it moves the seed away, but most of the time a plant puts its seed in a fruit. Not always. Sometimes a pine cone isn't really a fruit, but I suppose technically you could call it a fruit. Most fruit is edible and most fruit is sweet and most fruit is brightly colored. We think of things like cherries or plums or peaches or, you know, fruit is sweet and berries, raspberries, blackberries, they all have seeds in them. And the intention of plants is very clear to get animals to eat those things, to move the seeds to the next generation. Sometimes plants encase the seed in a very hard shell, like the stone fruits, peaches, plums, apricots, etc. Sometimes they put a lot of seeds in something like a strawberry, hoping that by sheer numbers, animals will not chew and destroy all of the seeds. And sometimes they do other things like an apple where they put sort of a membrane between the seeds and the actual sweet part of the fruit that kind of dissuades 
dissuades animals from eating them or that protects them in some way. But what we know is that while the seeds are very highly defended, containing things like digestive enzyme inhibitors or planogenic glycosides, which is a fancy word, but we can see the root there, cyanide, right? I mean, you know, apple seeds have a compound in them called latriol, which has cyanide derivative in them. And many of the other seeds have the same thing, like apricot seeds. A lot of the stone fruits have similar cyanogenic glycosides or digestive enzyme inhibitors or other things to sort of slow or inhibit digestion of the seeds to protect the seeds from excessive degradation in animal stomachs. And you see this in beans, right? They have these lectins, they have digestive enzyme inhibitors. I don't know if anyone in your audience has ever tried to eat a raw kidney bean, but if you eat too many, you will end up in a hospital and there are hundreds of documented cases of this, even in recorded history over the last 200 years, when people you know, eat undercooked kidney beans and have vomiting and diarrhea because of, primarily because of phytohemagglutinin, which is a lectin, a carbohydrate binding protein, just one of the defense chemicals in plant seeds that can cause these issues in human digestion. So there are many types of plant defense chemicals, and we can talk about each of them in turn or focus on some of them if you want. But we've talked about seeds and how plants defend them, lectins, oxalates, phytic acid, digestive enzyme inhibitors. They do the same things with leaves as well. You know, for instance, perhaps one of the most cherished leaves is spinach. But spinach is full of oxalates. It's full of this dicarboxylic acid, which is just a fancy word for this organic compound that can crystallize or accumulate in the human body. People who have had the unfortunate history of having kidney stones may know that the most common kidney stone in humans by a long shot, 70 to 80%, is calcium oxalate. Well, where does that oxalate come from? The majority of oxalate that ends up in the kidney tubules comes from your diet. Sometimes it can come from genetic polymorphisms, but those are very rare. Most of the oxalate that ends up precipitating in your kidney tubules, creating, creating painful kidney stones, is from your diet. Anecdotally, you know, my father, who's a retired physician, spoke to me a, a couple of years ago and had a recurrent kidney stone. And I said, what did you change in your diet? He said, well, I added back more spinach. It's just an N of one, but I think it's an interesting correlation there. So spinach is quite high in oxalate. Oxalates, again, are, occur in seeds and nuts commonly, and there's a whole separate rabbit hole we could go down in oxalate. Another commonly celebrated leaf is kale. And I have a I have a really fun t-shirt that says kale is bullshit. And I like to wear it around Whole Foods and see what kind of looks I get. And the reason I think that kale is bullshit and other brassica vegetables like collard greens or cabbage or cauliflower or Brussels sprouts or chard are bullshit is because of a family of compounds known as isothiocyanates. And without getting too technical, this is really a defense molecule in the plants. And it's meant to prevent animals and humans from absorbing adequate iodine. It's a known goitrogen. These are not made up words, they're clear. And we see this pathologically in many South American, Central American, and African cultures that don't have enough iodine in their diet. That is, they're not eating enough animal products, either fish or land animals, which have higher levels of bioavailable iodine. And they're relying mainly on roots like cassava, which is another plant, not from the brassica family, but that is very high in both cyanogenic glycosides and isothiocyanates. And they get these large necks, they get this goiter from hypothyroidism due to iodine deficiency. You can develop the same thing from eating too much broccoli if you don't have enough bioavailable iodine in your diet. And the intention of plants is quite clear here. There is a precursor molecule to sulforaphane, which is a commonly discussed isothiocyanate, which is called glucoraphanin. And when glucoraphanin combines with myrosin, that only happens when the plant is chewed. So the interesting question that I like to ask people sort of as a trick or a, an illustrative you know, line of thinking is how much sulforaphane is in broccoli? And the answer is zero until you chew it. How much sulforaphane is in broccoli sprouts? And it's zero until you chew it. And so until these plants get attacked, there's no sulforaphane in them. And so I'll pause there for your comments, but that's sort of the way that I think about plants as there's a lot more to talk about all of those and we can get into any piece of that you want, but plants clearly are defending themselves, but not always their fruit. And so I think of plants on a toxicity spectrum and I think of most vegetables, roots, stems, leaves, and seeds as much less biologically valuable for humans than fruit. Yeah, so in your book, The Carnivore Code, you do a pretty good takedown of most of these compounds, which are celebrated in the natural health community a lot. And as I was reading that, I started to think about, you know, some of the mental gymnastics and sort of the cognitive dissonance we go through with something like goitrogens, you know, because, you know, most of us have heard that and there's warnings about too much raw kale, too much, you know, cruciferous vegetables can be goitrogenic. Oh, but if you just cook them, 
or, you know, make sure you get enough iodine, you're going to be fine. And you just sort of write it off as like, okay, I don't really want to think about that anymore. But, you know, if you think about it, you know, these are toxins and why eat something toxic if you can get the micronutrients in other forms, which I think is a big point that you make. The other thing that I just want to mention, I remember watching a video from Chris Masterjohn, who I love years ago on talking about these specific compounds as being plant toxins. But he made sort of a point, which I know you've discussed quite a bit, that they're you know more hormetic, you know, that a little bit can strengthen the body, create sort of a positive stress or a minor stress response that the body then responds to in a positive way. And I guess he, I don't want to you know, I don't want to take his position, but I guess he kind of comes down on the side that these can be beneficial because of that hormetic effect where you would take the position that they're toxins and they really shouldn't be consumed. So can you talk a little bit about that and sort of, you know, why you feel so strongly that these really shouldn't be eaten by humans? Yeah, this is a really important point. And every time I talk about it, I hope that I can talk about it clearly. It's probably one of the more complex things, which makes me think that I haven't really been able to develop a way of talking about it that is clear enough, but I'll do my best. So when I was thinking about this in writing the book, I thought about hormetics or the process of hormesis, which is a word that we've made up, but it, essentially it means a little bit of a poison kills you. It makes you stronger. Like a lot of a poison can kill you, right? If you eat too much ice with iocyanates, if you eat too many goitrogens, you can get a problem, but a little bit can be good for you because it causes an improved response. And this was really interesting to think about. I thought, well, how do I think about that? Because there are some studies that show benefits to sulforaphane. And what are the benefits to sulforaphane? Specifically, you can give people sulforaphane or broccoli extracts and see their glutathione go up, right? That sounds like a good thing, a glutathione being this master, quote unquote, antioxidant in the human body. But then I came across a set of literature, and none of this literature is complete, but there are multiple interventional controlled studies where parallel groups of people are fed either high and low amounts of vegetables or large amounts of vegetables and no vegetables, presumably containing isothiocyanates. You know, the vegetables they use in these studies are not wimpy vegetables. You know, iceberg lettuce, they're giving them Jerusalem artichoke, they're giving them cabbage, they're giving them isothiocyanates. Cyanates. And in, in many studies, you find that when you compare a high versus a low vegetable group or more, perhaps more strikingly, a zero vegetable group, right, versus a high vegetable group, sometimes 600 grams of vegetables per day over a pound and a half of vegetables per day or a pound and a, like a pound and a third of vegetables per day, you don't see any differences in glutathione, DNA damage, monocytes, lymphocytes, any of the metrics you would expect to see different if that was actually having an effect. So there's a difference between doing a test tube study or saying, oh, your glutathione goes up when we give you sulforaphane, but it's more representative of a human organism to say, okay, does that mean that you're, that you have less DNA damage or you have lots, less oxidative stress or you have less activation of immune cells called monocytes or less, less lymphocytic activation? And many times the answer is no. And so people are kind of left scratching their heads going, what are vegetables actually doing if they're not improving these metrics. And, you know, the authors of these studies don't really mince words, but they've said things, and I'll paraphrase here again, you know, it, it appears that the endogenous antioxidant mechanisms of the human body are adequate in most individuals. And these are not individuals eating a, an, a diet that's rich in, in good quality grass-fed meat and organs or fruit or other micronutrient-rich foods, organs being something I'm particularly a fan of. This is just people eating essentially a standard American diet. So you'd love to do the experiment with like a really representative sample of an evolutionarily appropriate diet, something that like hot in Tanzania might eat rather than just a standard American diet plus or minus vegetables. But nevertheless, what you find is that, you know, that the endogenous antioxidant mechanisms of the human body are pretty robust and we may not need these vegetables. They may not actually be doing anything that is net positive. And then we're left with, well, they're definitely, they definitely have negatives. So they're not doing anything net positive. If you don't need vegetables to get antioxidants, which is a whole, you know, a whole can of worms that we can talk about, then why are you really eating them? And the other answer might be, oh, you're eating them from vitamins and minerals, but that's a very quick sort of dispatch because you can find many more vitamins and minerals, generally speaking, in animal foods, in animal meat and organs that are much more bioavailable with really no defense chemicals. And this is an important point that I perhaps should have made at the beginning of the podcast, which is that you just don't see animals 99.9% .9 of the time accumulating defense chemicals. Occasionally it happens in, in the animal kingdom. There's examples of blue ringed octopus and puffer fish that will accumulate toxins from algae to prevent, prevent predation by higher level 
trophic carnivores or animals in their relative ecosystems. But generally speaking, we're not aware of any defense molecules in a cow or a chicken or a turkey or a deer or a bison or salmon that, that are meant to, dis- dis- you know, to dissuade predation. They generally have mobility and teeth and claws and antlers adequate. And, you know, a cow is kind of a big thing. And though a cow is pretty susceptible to predation in 2021, their, their ancestors were aurochs and they're obviously, you know, in some way defended from bison, which are pretty formidable animals that will wreck you if you try and mess with them many times. So there's a real discordance here. And it made me think like, okay, I don't think we're, I don't think, I think there's more to the story. And, you know, the completion of that, or, you know, to bring it full circle, you can ask, why would we eat these plant chemicals if we can't show a clear benefit when we know there's a detriment? And how are these plants viewed within hunter-gatherer cultures? Is anthropology informative? And I think it is. And generally what you find, cultures like the Hadza or other hunter-gatherers, the Kung, there's not many left on the planet, but I had the fortune of visiting the Hadza in Tanzania earlier this year for a few weeks, is that they don't really go after salads. You know, they don't really go after leaves unless they are starving. And so there's a clear, high, clear hierarchy of foods in general with animal meat and organs being the most sought after food foods in the Hadza diet, followed by honey and berries and, you know, things like this, baobab fruit. And then, you know, they may eat some tubers, but many times they spit out the quid. They spit out the fiber because these tubers are quite fibrous for the starch. And they have a relatively moderate to low fiber diet. And they don't really go around saying, let's go see if we can pick some plant leaves. They say, let's go hunt an animal and look for some honey. And that makes a lot of sense, right? Why do humans have bitter taste receptors on their tongue? This is again, another rabbit hole we can go down, but it's to tell us that something is toxic, that you should not eat it. And this is where kids are quite prescient and we try and dissuade them from their wisdom as, or, you know, well-meaning parents say, you should eat that bitter kale or that bitter radish. And the kids are like, I don't want to eat that. That is bitter. It has defense chemicals. And so the hormesis piece is really important to understand. And the last piece of that I'll say, and I'm rambling a little bit, but is that there, when I thought about this, I could differentiate the chemicals in plants from exercise because people will say, oh, well, exercise is a hormetic as well. What's the difference? A little bit of a stressor, but exercise isn't a molecule. It's an environmental hormetic like ultraviolet rays are from the sun or like, you know, exercise efforts or like heat or cold. These are environmental hormetics. And I contrasted that. This is a schema that I've never seen actually, you know, before I thought about it, right? These are environmental hormetics versus molecular hormetics. Molecular hormetics being plant molecules, which are not dissimilar from pharmaceuticals that we use in Western medicine. If you were to give somebody a prescription for metoprolol, a beta blocker for their blood pressure or for an arrhythmia, you would tell them, hey, there's a side effect associated with this. It's going to affect your sympathetic nervous system. It could affect your blood sugar. But with these plant molecules, we've kind of given them a free pass and nobody understands that there are similar side effects to molecular hormetics. I don't deny that plant molecules are pharmacologically active in the human body and sometimes do interesting things. Chemotherapy is great for people that have cancer and many chemotherapies are derived from plants. But does that mean they're food or vitamins? No. A medicine is different than a vitamin. And so I've kind of bristled at this notion that food is medicine. Well, food is food, and medicine is medicine, and the two should not be confused. Just because curcumin affects the prostaglandin system, curcumin being a polyphenol from turmeric, which is also widely celebrated, doesn't mean you should eat it every day. Often prostaglandins have an important, indispensable role in the human body. Inflammation is a valuable signal that something is out of balance, and you shouldn't be abrogating your inf- inflammation with curcumin until you know what's causing it. And then furthermore, if you look, just like every other molecule, it's going to have side effects. Curcumin has a litany of side effects that could potentially be negative for humans. Does that kind of make sense? Totally makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking there's a few very simple pieces that I think the majority of people just don't know or have never thought about. And one of them, which you mentioned early on in your answer, is that we can get these micronutrients from animals. I think that a lot of people think of, you know, meat, steak, even fish, you know, and other animal products probably don't think much about organs. But when they think about eating animal products, they think about it as like protein and fat and they don't think about the micronutrient compounds in there. You look at an egg and it's, you know, just loaded with all sorts of things and most animal foods are. And one of the things that I love that you talk about in your book, which makes so much sense, is the different operating systems. So, you know, plants make compounds that work in plants and animals make compounds and chemicals that work in animals. And we're animals, we're not plants. So something like vitamin A is a really good example. You know, plants don't make vitamin A, they make beta carotene, which we can convert to vitamin A, but maybe don't need to. And that's probably not the most efficient way to get vitamin A. We can just get retinol, you know, pre-converted vitamin A in animal foods. So, you know, this is just an example. And there's many of those. There there are some compounds that don't exist in plants in any appreciable levels. Yeah. 
many. So I love this idea of these different operating systems. I think that a, paints a really clear picture of why we should be eating animals. You know, whether we should be eating plants or not is, I guess, a different argument. You obviously make a strong case that we shouldn't for most plants, but, but certainly we should be eating animals to get all those important vitamins, minerals, and nutrients and so forth. I want to mention your podcast because I, I, you do such a great job of bringing on <laughs> guests that you don't necessarily agree with and sometimes have almost nothing in agreement with in, in a few cases and have usually mostly friendly conversations with them about these things. And I think it's so great because you don't see that. It's like an echo chamber in a lot of these spaces. You know, vegans are interviewing other vegans and you know paleo keto people are interviewing other paleo keto people. So I think it's so important to, to share that. And so I just want to mention a few that I think people should check out. I, I loved your interview with, with Stephen Gundry. I thought that was really good, especially the fiber conversation. We're probably gonna have time to get into it today, but you know, a lot of people will think about plants and fiber. Go watch that interview because I think you did a great job of explaining why fiber is way overrated. And then I get a lot of patients, clients from the plant-based vegan community. A lot of them have been through, you know, Joel Furman or Neil Barnard or Cyrus and Robbie's program. And they maybe got a little bit better, but then their blood sugar stopped responding or they just couldn't get past, like they got their A1C maybe down into the low sixes, but they just couldn't get past that. And they were just eating beans and depending on who they came from, a lot of fruit or beans or you know nuts and seeds or whatever. So you have an interview with, I think all of those people, certainly with Joel Furman and then with Robbie Cyrus. And that was one of my favorites because I think all the questions that people have about vegan diets and the problem with eating animals or eating f high, higher fat diets or protein or and all these other things that so you did a great job of sort of dismantling all those arguments. So I just want to point people, since I know we're not going to have time to cover all of that here, I want to point people towards all those resources. And if you want to learn more about these plant compounds, lectins, oxalates, you know, sulforaphane, and I'm forgetting a lot of them, but all, you know, all the ones that we talked about here and more, get the Carnivore Code book because there's like, you know, a large section on each of these, you know, which, uh, which I think is so important. So yeah, it's great. And I highly recommend people check that out. I do want to talk specifically about diabetes because, you know, this is most people are listening to this, have some sort of blood sugar dysregulation, you know, metabolic dysfunction, which is a word that I also, a term that I also use, I think is a huge umbrella, you know, PCOS and prediabetes and most obesity, type 2 diabetes, you can even throw, you know, Alzheimer's disease, Cardiovascular maybe disease. osteoporosis under there somewhere. Stroke, you, know, you could throw cancer. Uh, cardiovascular disease. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is a huge umbrella and, you know, it's something like that one study showed 88% of Americans are not metabolically healthy, have, you know, w at least one of these metabolic risk factors. So, you know, it's a big, it's a big deal and people are looking for solutions. And I think people will try low carb, plant-based, keto, they'll get, usually we'll see they'll get better, but then they hit sort of this sticking point, you know, they sort of plateau. And I think that's how a lot of people find the carnivore diet or decide to try the carnivore diet. And I think it can be that extra thing. So I know you talked about your story with eczema and how you went through this. What, what have you seen with your own blood sugar and why do you think you know, this eating style can kind of help people break through some of those plateaus and maybe get even better results than they're getting with something? It's like such an important question. I think that these more of Western medicine needs to be really swinging the pickaxes and doing some archeological excavation and asking these deep questions. What the heck causes metabolic dysfunction, which is ultimately what we're all sort of hoping to understand. And I think that manifold. So there are many things that cause this, but I think that the two things that I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast are the major drivers that I see. And those are seed oils and processed sugars, that is glucose, fructose, sucrose, that are stripped from a food matrix. And I draw an important distinction there because there's interesting literature that when you consume sugar that is in a food matrix, it has a very different effect on your metabolism and your metabolic health than consuming sugar in a in, in, in table sugar or a reductionist 
you know, food matrix stripped context. And that's fascinating to me because it means that food is more than just macronutrients. And you sort of hinted at this, that when people see meat, when people see a food, they think calories and macronutrients, how much fat, protein, and carbohydrate, and how many calories. And then maybe they'll break down the macronutrients a little bit and think, oh, in the fat, is there any trans fat? Is there any saturated fat? That's about as far as they go. But I think it's really important to look at polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats and how oxidized the fats are. And it gets a little bit overwhelming for many people. And then as you discussed, there are so many micro micronutrients that are really critical evolutionarily to be an optimal kick-ass human. I mean, things like creatine, carnitine, choline, taurine, K2, B12, the list goes on and on, biotin, folate, riboflavin. These are not really found in bioavailable forms in any appreciable amount in plants. You know, heme iron, the list is long, so you must get animal foods. And so I think that in order for your biochemistry, all of these little dials and levers and gears to work, especially in your mitochondria, which is probably ground zero for metabolic dysfunction, you need both nutrients, you need the building block, you need micronutrients and you need the absence of things that appear to be toxic, right? And so those two are the conditions. So I think that my podcast is called Fundamental Health, by the way. And, you know, I think that, you know, when Robbie and Cyrus are doing their mastering diabetes approach, they're putting people on these vegan diets and they may or may not be excluding seed oils. So if they do exclude seed oils, they're doing something good and they're probably excluding processed sugar, but they're lacking the building blocks and people eventually become micronutrient deficient. We just know this. Robbie and Cyrus are great humans, but they're both basically almost cachectic. <laughs> they're very skinny <laughs> and they don't have enough protein because they're not getting enough bioavailable protein. And I appreciate them as humans, but I'm just calling a spade a spade in the most respectful, loving way. And they're micronutrient deficient because unless they're supplementing with all of these micronutrients, and then there are all the micronutrients that we don't even know about, right? We're not advanced enough in nutrition to really understand, oh, are they taking an ergothionine supplement? What about a BPC-157? What about a peptide that's uniquely found in, in liver, like hepatocyte growth factor? You're just not going to get that level of complexity in a supplement to bolster your vegan diet. So you're going to be deficient. And so I think that that approach runs aground eventually and people become both malnourished and under muscled, which is important for longevity and strength and all of those things. And, that, you know, but it's good that they're cutting out some processed food. I don't, like I said, I don't think they have a real appreciation for the problems with seed oils per se, because they're from, you know, plants. So maybe they're good. Ketogenic diets, I think are good in some sense because they eliminate carbohydrates, but I don't think that carbohydrates are the root cause of diabetes and metabolic dysfunction. And I've had others on the podcast as well, specifically Ben Bickman, who's a very intelligent PhD in the space. And we've had some friendly debate. We think similarly for many things, but Ben is of the perspective that it's sort of insulin induced insulin resistance, that it's excess carbohydrates. And in the keto community, people are saying, oh, it's this excess of carbohydrates that is causing you to become insulin resistant, AKA metabolically dysfunctional. And I don't agree with that because I think there's more nuance there. You asked about this specifically as an aside. In my own experience, I started out on a carnivore diet, which was fully meat and organs and fat or desiccated organs when I couldn't get fresh organs. And I, you know, felt pretty good for a while. And then I developed a lot of the long-term problems that happen with ketogenic diets in humans. We have amazing physiology. We can go without carbohydrates for long amounts of time, but our kidneys really do benefit from an insulin signal. Insulin gets vilified, but insulin is a critical hormone in the human body. Ask a type 1 diabetic what happens when you don't have insulin. You can see a lot of pathology there. So if the kidneys don't get an insulin signal, which predominantly happens from eating carbohydrates, they will not resorb enough electrolytes. And so people almost invariably, I hesitate to skirt around hyperbole here, but I've just seen it so often at our company, Heart and Soil. We do sort of health coaching around these desiccated organs that we make that people will say like, I feel great on carnivore and now I have palpitations or now I have muscle cramps or now I can't sleep. And it almost always resolves when you add carbohydrates back. But these have been so demonized by the well-intentioned, intelligent ketogenic community that people will equate honey that is raw and organic and treasured by the Hadza across the world or the Ikung or any equatorial culture and is eaten without appreciation, without concern by the Hadza. And I've observed this or fruit. They'll equate that with a processed sucrose, you know, a table sugar. And I just think there's some really interesting research to suggest that those are not the same thing. And there's more information in the food matrix that affects the way carbohydrates are processed and the body. I appreciate the work of Robert Lustig, but he has, I think, overly vilified fructose without the appropriate context. And so Stephen Gundry and I disagreed about that ideologically as well. And I think you see plenty of healthy diets that include fructose and fruit that aren't necessarily the same as someone eating table sugar or other fructose containing media, like a high fructose corn syrup in a soda. I mean, I was just came across a study the other day. You know, if you give someone high fructose corn syrup and soda, there's an imperfect metric you can do, you know, with a blood vessel in your arm and you can take an ultra 
ultrasound and look at the way the blood vessel dilates after you inflate a blood pressure cuff. And that's thought to be a, some, a surrogate marker of endothelial function. And you see endothelial dysfunction arise when you give people soda or high fructose corn syrup. But if you give them a, a, a red orange juice, their endothelial function is fine. And so what's the difference there, right? Like, is it less of the sugar? No, you can match for fructose. You can match for sucrose. It's a different food signal to the human body. It's a whole food matrix. So this is all just to say that I think the keto movement is well-intentioned. And if people are metabolically dysfunctional, they generally have broken handling of carbohydrates. So the removal of carbohydrates helps a little bit, but they haven't corrected the root cause, which in my opinion has to do with mitochondrial membranes that are overly saturated with evolutionarily inappropriate levels of linoleic acid and other polyunsaturated fats. And that's a mouthful. So I'll say it again. So it's, I think it has to do with membranes and signaling at the level of our cell membranes. And Evolutionarily, I think that linoleic acid, this 18-carbon omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acid, is present in our diets in much, much higher amounts than it ever has been, at least in the last 100 years and probably in the last 150 years. And there's a strong correlation. Now, correlation is not causation, but there's a very strong correlation between that increase, that explosion of linoleic acid in the human diet from 1% to 2% to 15-plus percent of our calories and massively increased chronic illness. And if we're thinking about correlations and doing some sort of reverse engineering detective work, we can generate hypotheses for what might be causing this chronic disease epidemic. Well, I appreciate the work of the vegans, and I think most of them are well-intentioned, but there's actually, people are eating less red meat, you know? So if you think red meat is the cause of your diabetes or saturated fat is the cause of your diabetes, right. then there's really no, that's an inverse correlation historically in humans. So that's probably not some a hypothesis to put a lot of money on in Vegas. And people are eating more plants and people are eating more quote unquote healthfully, which generally means more beans, more of salads, and they're also eating more seed oils. And so just in terms of what number I'm betting on in Vegas, I'm thinking, I think it's that one. So I'm going to go explore that. And when you go down that rabbit hole, you find hmm. lots of fascinating mechanisms that could explain this. And you see it, you see it in practice too. You see it that when people cut out the seed oils, that's when things really start to improve. Now it takes our body a little while to recycle membranes. And so it doesn't happen overnight. Interesting. But it, it definitely happens. And that to me is quite interesting. And without getting into all of the mechanistic studies and stuff in this podcast, we'll keep it high level. I'll just say that feel strongly that it's basically about eating an evolutionarily appropriate diet, a species appropriate diet for humans, which is what we're all, I don't know if everyone is trying to understand that, but that's what I'm trying to understand. You know, I think that there is a, and that's where the code of the carnivore code comes in. And since writing the mm -hmm. carnivore code, my perspective has expanded a little bit. And I think that it's fine for humans to eat the least toxic parts of plants. And I want to give them the lots of freedom to do that, things like avocado or fruit or squash, which are actually fruit. And we can talk about what a carnivore-ish diet or an animal-based diet might look like. But I think that when you do that, when you align millions of years of hominid and homo sapien evolution with a diet that is what we sought and obtained. Amazing things happen in human physiology and health. And, you know, I appreciate, you know, diabetes is critical. Metabolic dysfunction is critical. And I think that the main culprit is seed oils. And there's fascinating studies, even with honey, for instance, a substance that has a lot of sugar and they can give this to diabetics and they'll see their A1C go up a little bit because you might spike their blood sugar. But overall, when they do more sophisticated metrics of insulin sensitivity, their insulin sensitivity improves. So how right, can it be right. as simple as I just like, sugar uh, I causes diabetes, on right? One of your podcasts, maybe it was, with, I can't remember, but you talked about the AUC, the area under the curve. And I think you were wearing a CGM at the time. I'm not sure if you're still doing that, but you could track, and we recommend this to you know all of our clients, but you can actually look at not just the glycemic excursion, how high the blood sugar goes up, but how long does it stay up? How quick is the recovery? And with something like honey, I would suspect, and you could probably confirm this, that you're going to have a very quick you know recovery. So the AUC, that area that your you know, blood sugar was actually high, even if it went up, I don't know, 40, 50 points or something, which it probably wouldn't. But even if it does, it comes down so quickly that it's really negligible. It's not really going to have much of an impact on your overall health. I think you're absolutely right. And I agree with that. There are many in the health space who will put what I consider to be arbitrary ceilings on blood sugar, which constrain people's food choices too much. And many of these people will advocate, you know, on cakes with made with sorbitol right. and they took a carbose and they got no excursion of their blood sugar. And I'm thinking that's not a metric that I really care about. You know, I don't care how high my blood sugar goes. Obviously I think for 
a quote unquote normal human physiology, even with a ton right. of high glycemic index carbohydrates, like honey, your blood sugar probably won't go over 180. You know, most of the time when I've worn continuous glucose monitors from NutriSense, which is a company I like, that doesn't go above 120 or 130. Maybe it goes to 140. But the, as you're saying, you know, it's probably going to induce a little bit of PTSD in your audience. But the integral, which is the area under the curve, if you inverted the curve and you poured water into it, what's the volume of water you could pour in there? Is it large or small? It's an indication. It's really a proxy for your insulin area under the curve, because that's what we really care about. How much insulin is being released? You know, we don't, we sometimes care about glucose area under the curve, and I think it's a valuable metric as well, but it's also a good indicator of insulin area under the curve. And so when you have a quick spike and your blood sugar might go to 140, and then within an hour or even 45 minutes, it's back on the baseline, there's essentially a very small area under the curve. And somebody that eats, you know, something that has a lower glycemic index might get the same area under the curve because their blood sugar goes up 15 points, but it stays elevated for two to three hours. And so that's really the deciding factor for me. And you can also tell with those continuous glucose monitors, if you're experienced in looking at them, what a metabolically healthy pattern is versus a metabolically unwell pattern. And so for myself, I mean, I've done this experiment personally and with many of my clients where I was ketogenic. I had electrolyte issues. I had sleep disturbance. My testosterone was going down. I had palpitations and I added back in carbohydrates. Now, this was a little bit difficult for me because I admit that I was a little bit dogmatic as well. And I had to kind of reconsider my perspectives, but I like thinking, continuing to evolve my perspective and continuing to learn. I'm not right about everything. And so when I added carbohydrates back, I wore a continuous glucose monitor and I would eat honey twice a day for weeks and weeks and I wore CGMs and you didn't see any elevation of the baseline blood sugar. My hemoglobin A1C went down from 5.4 or 5.6 to 4.8. And then, you know, my fasting insulin actually stayed the same or went down to less than three with a C-peptide of 0.45. So really low fasting insulin metrics, you know, really low fasting blood sugar, really low A1C, despite including very high glycemic index carbohydrates in my diet. And people would say, well, yeah, you're very healthy, Paul. Well, that's the whole point, right? Like a healthy individual can eat those foods without them causing diabetes. They don't cause diabetes. You know, I didn't get diabetes with a month of daily honey and or weeks and weeks or, you know, six months because I come back in six months and do, it looks exactly the same and my fasting insulin remains. 2.9, 3.2, very low. So I think that there's a lot of nuance there, but it's important to kind of sort those things out and not get stuck in the dogma of either vegan diets or plant-based diets or ketogenic diets. And ultimately, I think this is probably the, the focus of your question. I've taken a long time to answer it, but I think that the way to correct metabolic dysfunction and diabetes is to approach it with that evolutionary lens and to eat an ancestrally consistent diet. And I think that prioritizing meat and organs and animal fat, not fearing saturated fat, and then getting the least toxic plant foods, that being fruit, honey, squash, avocado, which is a fruit, is the way to do it. And by doing that, you will eliminate processed sugars, seed oils, etc., and you will avoid many of the downstream consequences of long-term ketogenic diets. Very cool. So uh, you just made a big point about seed oils and the damage that can be done to mitochondrial membranes, cell membranes, and so forth, and that being a big driver for metabolic disease. I think the predominant theory in the low-carb community right now centers around the adipocyte, the fat cell, and this idea that we have this personal fat threshold, and a lot of it comes from over-consuming hyper-palatable foods, which again, processed seed oils and refined sugars and grains being probably the major source of those calories coming in. And, you know, the adipocyte swells, it gets, starts spewing out inflammatory cytokines and that drives this inflammation, which causes, leads to insulin resistance and eventually turns into diabetes. Is that something that, you know, you feel like is backed up by science? Is that something you agree with? Or do you think it really has more to do with the effect of the seed oils? It's both. The, I think it's the seed oils level. at the mitochondrial level in could, the adipocyte. Sites, right? Because adipocytes have mitochondria as well. And yeah, the, what mm -hmm. you see in diabetes and metabolic dysfunction almost invariably is, you know, hypertrophied rather than hyperplastic fat cells, adipocytes that are broken and they do leak and they leak, you know, non-esterified fatty acids, which we call NEFA, and they leak inflammatory mediators. And I think that the way that the fat cells get broken is seed oils. So there's actually good evidence that this is mechanistically sound, that excess linoleic acid can lead to adipocyte dysfunction. I could probably send you a couple of papers on this. So excess linoleic acid metabolites, OxLAMs is the acronym, oxidative you know, metabolites of linoleic acid metabolism or oxidized products of linoleic acid metabolism do contribute to this fatty acid cell, this fat cell, excuse me, dysfunction. So yes, it is leaking of the adipocyte and real impairment of the adipocyte's ability to divide because hyper 
Dysplasia is when the adipocyte, you know, sort of divides and makes more adipocytes. And hypertrophy is when the adipocyte gets swollen. So you find these adipocytes that are unable to divide. They probably want to. Something is going on with the genetics. You get these swollen hypertrophic adipocytes that are leaking all sorts of inflammatory mediators. And it is those inflammatory mediators which are inappropriately signaling at the level of the muscle to be, quote unquote, insulin resistant. And that is metabolic dysfunction. So yes, I think it's that is the case. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. The actual place in which the mitochondria are most damaged or the proximate event is in the fat cell. And that has to do with excess seed oils, which appear to leave the door open. They appear to allow the adipocyte to take on more nutrients and become hypertrophic when it should be refusing those nutrients. Does that make sense? Totally makes sense. Yeah. And no, yeah. I'd love to, I'd love to get those papers. I'll follow up with you afterwards because uh, yeah, I'm really, I'm fascinated by that, that whole idea. So let's break this down and get a little bit more practical here for people who are watching and who, who maybe want to do this. You've gone through a couple iterations of the, an animal based diet over you know the past several years. It sounds like what do you feel like, or maybe it's just what you're eating now. Maybe it's the same answer, but I was going to say, what do you feel like is sort of the optimal human diet? diet at this point and you know what maybe you could describe for people a little bit about kind of what you eat every day or how you know how a practical animal based diet looks so that people you know can get it kind of yeah, get I'm happy to share my perspective like on this, this my paradigm and before I do that I'll offer people a maxim which is they can accept or reject but I think that the optimal human diet would be as rich in bioavailable nutrients as possible with as the fewest number of toxins as possible so I think that if, if you do that if that that is your equation. When I solve that equation, I end up with a carnivore-ish type diet. And this is essentially a diet that is majority animal foods, you know, meat and organs. And we can talk about how much of those are critical. Meat, organs, and animal fats that come with them without a fear toward any of those animal fats. So I think that, you know, I think for many people, oh, 0.8 to 1 gram of protein per pound of goal body weight is a good place to start with protein. And that can be from a variety of sources, that being organs and muscle meat or raw dairy, if people tolerate dairy. Not everyone does, but I think it's very nutritious in those who do tolerate it. And that is the center of the diet. And I think that's both evolutionarily consistent, anthropologically consistent, like we talked about with the Hadza, and very nutrient rich. I mean, it's very difficult to deny the importance of organs. So I'll just emphasize that for a moment. Muscle meat is incredibly nutrient rich, but doesn't have many of those things we talked about. So muscle meat doesn't have much folate, doesn't have much riboflavin, doesn't have much biotin, doesn't have as much K2 or choline or any of the unique peptides or growth factors, ergothionine, things like this that are found in organs. I mean, they have a little bit, but the organs are just this, you know, cornucopia of unique nutrients. And one of the fascinating things for me within medicine and nutritional medicine and the intersection of those two fields today is, is trying to understand or at least being humble in the face of the realization or accepting the realization that we don't even understand understand all of the vitamins and minerals, quote unquote, that humans need and thrive on. And I think that many of those are found in organs. We're finding new peptides, small protein molecules all the time. People may be familiar with things like BPC-157, which occurs naturally in stomach and in intestine. They may be familiar with other peptides that are found in brain. And there's many unique nutrients in liver and brain and testicle and ovaries and stomach and tripe and kidney and pancreas. And so, you know, most of us can't get these things or we're not actually hunting with the Hadza and being privy to the bounty that they're going to distribute among the tribe. So that, that I think is an important thing to consider. The key indispensable element of an animal-based, aka carnivore-ish diet, which I believe is very species appropriate, is getting adequate organs. So people struggle with that. They can check out you know, the other work that I do. That's why I built Heart and Soil, which is a company that makes desiccated organs in capsules from grass-fed, grass-finished cow organs in New Zealand. So we've got protein from meat. We've got organs, either fresh or desiccated. And then I think you add to that carbohydrates, which are critical, and those should come in the least toxic form for humans, which I believe is the least defended parts of plants or honey, depending on what people's goals are. Things like fruit, which can be many incarnations that we don't think of as fruit, but are actually fruit, like squash or avocado. I'm in Texas right now. I spend a lot of my year in Costa Rica. I eat a lot of bananas. I eat papaya and I eat honey. And sometimes I'll eat other seasonal local fruits like rambutan or other things like that. But in the States, I have to get what is it? Whole foods, you know, right? Now it's organic grapes, maybe some bananas, some oranges. And I think those fruits are good sources of both further micronutrients for humans and they are food matrix 
contained or housed sugars, which appear to have benefits for humans. So that is really the gist of it. There's a few nuances. If you'd like me to clarify, I guess I'll just describe my diet, for instance, for people. So I'm 170 pounds. So I aim for about 170 grams of protein per day, which is a little less than two pounds of meat. And that's a combination of meat and organs. I'll probably eat an ounce, a half ounce of liver a day, a couple of ounces of heart a day. I like to eat testicle. I've found a lot of benefits and through heart and soil, we've seen some amazing benefits to testicle. Again, never really think about as humans. And I'll also try and get some brain, either fresh or desiccated. So I'm eating the organs as a combination of desiccated and fresh, a few ounces a day, plus about, you know, in total with the meat, maybe 1.7 pounds of meat. And then I'll add to that at my meals, maybe anywhere from 100 to 200, maybe 250 grams of carbohydrates every day. I don't really get worried about it. I kind of guide my eating based on what I think, how much I've done for the day. Some days I surf three and a half hours. Some days I surf two hours and I get a workout and I'm a little, you know, more interested in carbohydrates, but that's what I do in my day. I usually eat two meals. I try to eat the last meal of the day with a good few hours before I go to sleep. Sometimes I'll eat a small meal in the morning before I go surf with papaya and banana, maybe coconut water out of a real coconut we have in Costa Rica rather than Tetra Pak or something processed, which I don't really like to drink, I'm spoiled on coconut water. And then I'll, yeah, then I'll come back and eat breakfast of meat, organs, right. animal fat included, fruit, honey. Recently, I've added raw dairy back to my diet and found it to be very, very enjoyable. I have a lot of interest in colostrum, which is the first milk from animals. I think it has benefits in the gut. It's very high in immunoglobulins and it has benefits for us immunologically. And so I wanted to try and include colostrum in my diet again, and maybe the, even the option of raw fermented dairy in my diet. Previously, I thought that I'd had issues with recurrence of eczema and this time doing 100% exclusively raw dairy, that being things like Parmigiano-Reggiano cheese and raw milk here in Co in Austin or Costa Rica and I can get it. I don't seem to have any recurrence of my eczema, which has been good because warm, not hot, but warm raw milk with honey is one of the most delicious things on the planet. People may find this gross, but I take this sort of ancestral perspective quite seriously. I was recently at a farm in Texas for a turkey harvest and I drank raw warm turkey blood. Many people are worried about, you know, infections, but you know, I think that there's risk and benefit to everything, but I wanted to taste raw animal blood and it was very delicious. And, you know, there's many cultures that do this. They'll, the Maasai, the Samburu will combine raw milk with blood. And I, I can understand why now it's very delicious, but you know, there's ways to get blood as well in desiccated form. If people don't want to drink that, it's hard for me to get real raw blood. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, that, much of a leap, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it's just one of these things. That's a, just a cultural <laughs> shift. You know, we're just not used to doing it. And you know, I've done a few organs, but I really need to expand my organ repertoire because it's, you know, it's an area that I know is super Close healthy to it and in childhood. You just it can be sort hard. of got to get past it. It can to be hard. To try it. I mean, but when I posted about drinking the raw turkey blood, there were probably <laughs> the majority of the comments were probably like, that's gross. I could never do it. But there were definitely people yeah. saying, Hey, we do this in my culture. Why is this weird to you guys? And I, and I think it's really cool. And it, it's certainly certainly nutritious. I mean, there's all kinds of things in blood. Blood is a great source of vitamin D, right. you know, bioavailable immunoglobulins and factors and all kinds of things, immune cells, all kinds. Of, I mean, blood is incredibly rich in all kinds of things, heme iron, et cetera. So, but I mean, you can, you don't have to start with blood or testicle or brain. You can start with liver and heart and do oh, really yeah, well. I mean, sure. how many people eat liver or heart? Like probably the, you know, a, a vast minority of people listening to this. So just start there, start with liver and heart. I try to be the leading edge of this thing as much as I can or contribute oh, yeah. as much as possible. So I wanted to eat as many organs and, you know, at Heart and Soil, we've got formulas with all of those organs in it. So it's pretty fun. Yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned your supplement company, which I think is a great shortcut for a lot of people who just either don't have the time or are a little bit nervous to try it and haven't incorporated the organs yet. It's a great way to get all those. Ants. And, you know, it's not just the vitamins and minerals. I mean, you talk about the various peptides that you'll find in, in these organs, and there's just so much that we just don't know about still probably. So I love that idea of the desiccated organ supplements. What, real quick, I wanted to ask you, what do you think yeah, about eggshells? There's actually egg been studies if you're not looking at eggshells for osteoporosis and they've any had value data. to like uh, crushing Anecdotally, when I've shells? used eggshells, sometimes they cause calcium? constipation. I think the calcium carbonate in an eggshell can bind bile acids for some people, so they can cause constipation unless you know mm. I don't take any. We don't make any at hardened soil of eggshell membrane for collagen, mm. so there's probably benefit there. If people are not doing dairy, I favor like microcrystalline hydroxyapatite, which is the center cortex of a bone for calcium. Yeah, that's my favorite source. It doesn't seem to be as constipating and there's, you know, other benefits to that, that 
that form of calcium. And yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Well, we could go on forever. There's a lot to talk about, but I think we'll kind of wrap it up there. I just have one more question for you, but before I do that again, just want to mention fundamental health podcast. Check that out. It's I think I do. You know, one of, if so not the, the best podcast thing about writing out a book there. Is so you sort of freeze your ideas and podcast. It's a and Star Wars reference, the book right? is the carnivore. And I think, the, I think that healthy ideas should evolve. Well, right or no? So the fun thing about writing a cookbook, which will be out early February, it's called the carnivore code cookbook. You can pre-order <laughs> right. on Amazon now. Right. Is that you get to sort of update your ideas. It's an animal based cookbook. So it's a carnivore ish cookbook. It's not just meat and organs. Most of the recipes okay, cool. have fruit and squash and things that add a lot of variety to a diet that I think is still amazing for humans and evolutionarily mm. appropriate. And that's where the, ner- the terms carnivore-ish or animal-based come in. The best place is probably to start at heartandsoil.co. It's and if people co. want to find out more about We've got a lot of resources there, the, blog, the heart heart information. Uh, There's what's the best place for them to go there? questions. We've got a whole team at Heart and Soil that are like health coaches that'll help walk people through how to begin animal-based diets with really no, no strings attached. We just want to you know, put good out there in the world. And if people benefit from our supplements, great. But if they get fresh organs, that's fantastic too. So that's the good place to start. I think a lot of the resources are there. Very cool. Send you some. I'm on day seven of my carnivore-ish diet. I'm doing- How are you um, feeling? Mostly meat. I haven't had any organs yet, but I'm going to try some soon. It's often the and, last uh, thing to go yeah, for very people. Cool. It's often the last and, thing to uh, go. And a little bit of fruit. The only thing I'd berries. say is that sounds great. You know, I think that uh, I haven't given up my coffee yet. I, I that's a good, like good place a to start. It's probably morning, very so low we'll carb. <laughs> I think most people do well or best when they get at least 100 grams of carbohydrates to a day. That's apostasy in many keto circles, but I think it's just, I think that's kind of the cutoff. So it's a little tricky for people to get 100 grams of carbohydrates from berries alone. So just think about how many carbohydrates you're getting. Sure. Berries are great, but you have to eat a lot of berries to get 100 grams of carbohydrates. A couple of tablespoons of honey will help with that or a few other, you know, an orange or a banana will help with those too. Yeah, true. Right. Okay, cool. Good advice. So this is a concept uh, that so the last question I have for I you is about something involved that you into talk about and hashtag as I began to realize the remembering. through the process so that this is much more what, than food, what's the right? remembering what's that, that mean to you This is an evolutionarily appropriate diet but there's other pieces to this equation that are critical for us What about sunlight what about community what about grounding what about nature what about adventure what about risk taking what about vulnerability and so I think that all of this is sort of couched it's all framed by this idea of who we are as humans and that to be really most happy and most fulfilled, we have to realize, and this may sound extreme to people, but like the idea of this human zoo, you know, we accept the comforts of a human zoo to have climate controlled rooms. It allows me to do this podcast with you, but we're not really supposed to be in hermetically sealed buildings. You know, we're supposed to be breathing air from plants and looking at skies and long vistas, which are good for our parasympathetic nervous system. I mean, there's many more pieces to health beyond diet. And so I think this is just one critical piece of the equation. And it is a broader sort of remembering of where we've come from as humans. It's definitely a, you got to remember what foods you're supposed to eat or think about that. But I think you also have to remember like, oh, wow, cold exposure is good. Like I should definitely get real sunlight. Like I should spend time with my friends and connect with people and do things that are meaningful and look at a fire at night and wonder at the stars and go in saunas and do things that are challenging, that really push you and form communities around things that are mutually meaningful and look at the horizon. I just think that's the, something that many of us don't do. I've been thinking about it a lot being back in Austin. I like this city a lot, but a lot of parts of the city remind me of something that I talked about with Michael Easter when I had him on my podcast. He's the author of The Comfort Crisis. And he had a phrase, landscapes of despair, of despair. I butchered that, landscapes of despair. And I think that it's fascinating to think about the human visual system and the way that we are really programmed, just like we're programmed to have an evolutionarily appropriate diet, we're programmed to have an evolutionarily appropriate frame of vision. And that's supposed to have a lot of fractals, like trees and hills and uh, horizons. It's not supposed to have a lot of right angles. And, and, you know, I think many people may experience this sort of dystopian feeling that kind of gnaws at us when you're in a, uh, an industrial park or when you're in the industrial part of town, or if you're, you know, downtown, maybe you're going downtown to have dinner with your spouse. And so you're excited, but you know, in the daytime, I'm driving around some of these industrial areas of Austin. You just feel like this is gross. There's not enough trees relative to humans, but then you might go over a hill and you get into a nice suburban neighborhood and there's more trees, there's more fractals. And so these landscapes of despair, I think are 
prevalent, they're ubiquitous. And this is just another piece of sort of remembering where we've come from as humans and saying, I don't think humans should go back to living like the Hadza. They basically wear animal skins and live in thatched huts that they break down and they're nomadic. But I think remembering all the pieces of that make us deeply happy are critical and incorporating as many of those in your life will give you more fulfillment. That's a, yeah, that's a beautiful message. So totally clarifying. Different. I love the water. I'm like a water guy. So I live right on the bay here and just wake up every morning and look at that sunrise over the bay and it's like medicine. Yes, it's beautiful. Thanks for having me on, brother. It's been great so, to connect with you. All right, Dr. Paul Saladino, thank you so much for spending some time here with me and being on the podcast. It's, it's been a great pleasure and honor. Absolutely. And uh, for all of you, I hope you enjoyed this and make sure you check out our next episode, Mastering Blood Sugar Podcast. Talk to you soon. 